Hallo miteinander. I'm Geschädi6. And this is Toho Kokushin. Last time, we heard that this game was served to the lord and master of everything that is Toho, Zun, who I sincerely hope was still sober enough to perceive what was even happening around him. If not, well, I guess everyone still had a good time regardless. Our episode already starts with a good omen, we get a Sagittarius form. It has so amazingly many hit points on it, bringing us over the 4000 mark for the very first time. The other stats on it aren't as impressive as I would have hoped, but I still got the feeling it was preferable to what we had, even if the game brands it with a lower rarity value. Only purple text. Perhaps in the future, we'll find another improvement, one where we needn't have any doubts. There's another type of armor that may not be good at all, but it at least somewhat amuses me with its name, Princess Capricorn. Like all the western zodiacs, Capricorn is from Latin and basically describes a type of wild goat. Princess Capricorn. It's like a childish sneering taunt Moko would aim towards Kaguya. Oh, if it isn't Princess Capricorn. Was the grass I made you eat after my last victory tasty, you goat? <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that Paragon of Maturity would say something like that. I once heard goats were a symbol for hardiness. Yet nowadays, I feel that it's an animal that makes everyone snicker just by its mention. I blame Goat Simulator. Let's not talk about Goat Simulator now. This tangent has gone on long enough. Instead, some general information about the 16th sublevel. It is a very short and linear area. And for a pleasant change, it's one that is relatively easy to navigate through. Enemies of course are as tough as ever, but you won't get lost in here at least. There's really just one road it will lead you on, with a few goodies here and there in the niches. Many of the rooms and corridors aren't even accessible. We should be able to complete B16 very swiftly, Unless we die, of course, and respawn at the very start of the floor. Then we would have to retrace all of our steps. Simply rushing through on the shortest line is not possible, when the area is so much on rails. I guess that's another penalty for dying in this game, having to get back to where you were before. In MMOs, you speak of this as a corpse run. In bizarrely many of these games, you will find an actual mangled corpse of your character where you died, and you pick it up to regain experience and other resources. Not in Toho Kokushin. Level 54, Rockin. This Skull Chariot sneak attack was not so rockin'. Could we have done anything to prevent that? I dare to say we did not. The second one gave us slightly more time to react, which didn't help. Maybe it could have been avoided, but it was still a very fiendish move. Anyway, a corpse run. Imagine someone in a movie found an identical corpse of themselves. I don't think they would just collect it and move on with their lives. I think they would scream, lose their lunch, and forever believe they lived only in the Matrix. I really wish we could have hit more than just one of those Steel Knights with our spell. Again, this clearly looks like a situation where there's no shame in flight. Yeah, to keep fighting there would have been a big mistake. And right here, we have another Sagittarius form. With the first one, I had the impression it was a pretty bad specimen of that item. It turns out I was wrong. The second isn't any better at all. 
I generally try to avoid comparing items on camera for this let's play. Just this time, I was itching to know. For the most part, I learn in advance which items are worth equipping. In the past, when I only played this game for myself, I was the worst micromanager. That is typical for me in a lot of the games that I play. I think hard to squeeze even the smallest of numbers, and I believe while recording, doing that would be extremely annoying. I think it's important to be aware of these things. When you're filming yourself in a way, you've got to put yourself into your viewer's shoes and be more flexible. We are only one step away from reaching the 17th sub-level. Unless some completely unforeseen accident happens in its last moments, B16 really was a quick and easy experience, as predicted. B17 likely won't be so tame, but we'll see. The southern and eastern corridors here are both closed, so yeah, there's not much else to do but leave. Well, I don't like the look of our health bar, so let's grab one last refreshment. Much better. Shortly after the episode started, only about one minute in, we encountered a wormhole gem. I didn't comment on it back then, but here's another one. It seemed like the game had completely forgotten about those, as if starting from the 11th sublevel, gravity gems had taken their place. It was a false hope. From now on, the labyrinth can and will use both of these traps to ruin our day. Never in the same room, of course. That would be madness. We've only cleared a single chamber, but already we have to use our safety net. It's really too bad, but we had no choice. Once again, back to trap gems. The question comes up. Which are worse, wormhole or gravity gems? Comparing them is very difficult, as you would need the same number and quality of enemies in a room, and that's almost never the case. There's one fundamental difference about them that decides it for me. Gravity gems are consistent, you just can't ever jump when they're in range. Wormhole gems, on the other hand, only affect you in bursts. I think they activate their pull every 4 seconds or so. Now you could think this would make the gravity gems more problematic, but I think differently. My vote easily goes to the wormhole gem, because it's all about chaos. When I'm up against a gravity gem, I understand not to jump, I can adapt to that rule. But when a wormhole gem goes off, any kind of strategy I had, any kind of control I had, is ripped from me. Lots of kappa in this part of the map. Here's another one. Another gross and ugly kappa. That's a mean thing to say, but not without reason. The kappa of the Tohoverse aren't designed to be ugly. Some might even call them adorable. I am very sure though Japanese mythology declares them to be quite monstrous. I wasn't exactly able to verify it, but I believe I once heard disfigured infants in Japan's less educated medieval times were thought to be kappa half-breeds. People of that age knew nothing of such wizardry that is genetics, or that DNA is a complicated thing that doesn't always turn out as intended. The concept of a mother having a close encounter with a water goblin was much more plausible back then. You just assumed she didn't want everyone to know. I think it was in episode 3 when I first called the kappa gross, but I didn't exactly explain the idea behind that. Now you finally know. We've got a pretty impressive combo right now. With how hard the game has gotten, it's so easy to lose your streak, but it's also very easy to build it up. There's always a lot of enemies, and they take more hits than they did in the past. 
it all adds up. Nonetheless, now less than ever before, I pay little attention to my hit counter. I am far too distracted now just trying to survive. It quite surprises me that we are still deathless when it comes to the labyrinth. The first time I played through it, I had died like 10 or so times at this point already. I distinctly remember my cash had gone down to under half from when I entered. That reminds me, in episode 9 I mentioned the English patch could alter parameters to make Toho Kokushin ludicrously hard. That is only an overused word, so let me elaborate. You can make each parameter 8 times its vanilla value, so you can make enemies 8 times as durable and have them deal 8 times the damage back to you. That makes the game 64 times as hard, and I call that Kokushin Souls. Nah, that's not fair. Most From Software games are hard in a very calculated and tested manner. 64 times as hard Toho Kokushin would just be completely unintended. Satori's Master Spark and the ramming attack of Hisotensoku would both kill you in a single hit. As would another mystery attack we haven't encountered yet. Come to think of it, there is another parameter that you can change. It's the rate at which you gain spell energy. You can set it to be absolutely flooded with energy and go on a spell card spree, or that you barely get any at all. This option however is marked as experimental in the patch, and I've personally never tampered with it. I can't tell you whether it works or not. This green mushroom dropped something I would have never expected to see. A Demon Blade Lavatane. You may know this is a weapon belonging to a certain someone, a certain young mistress. It is a very powerful weapon, but that isn't even the most remarkable thing about it. It has a weapon unique skill assigned to it, which is, well, the Lavatane. It swings a large sword around your character, which not only deals major damage, but also covers a huge area. On the downside, however, it is excessively expensive. It's 8 skill diamonds per use, I believe. You've got to think before you waste that. The question comes up, if it's such a great weapon, why aren't we putting it on right now? Why don't we try out that Lavatane skill? Well, we would have to ditch the Pilfering Knife, and the Lavatane is not at all meant for treasure hunting. The Pilfering Knife is really starting to put on some rust against those level 60 enemies, but I really want to squeeze as much use out of it as I can. The Lavatane, by the way, is a legendary magical weapon of Norse mythology. I mentioned it once in another video project of mine, in which I also made a silly mistake. I'm still a little embarrassed for that. In the video, I said, or rather wrote, that the Lavatane had nothing to do with fire. I don't know what gave me that idea, but it is totally wrong. The Lavatane can conjure up all the fire. I hope you're not too disappointed that I didn't show you the Lavatane's unique skill. Rest assured that I will do that at some point, and I already know when, so please be patient. B17 should be very well cleaned up by now. We've already gotten pretty far today. We'll only be playing half of the 18th sublevel again. What can I tell you about this one? Well, for once it's pretty tough, but I've also noticed that there are a lot of health vases standing around. So it may be tough, but it's by no means unfairly tough. We have all the reasons to be motivated, and now we have even more reasons to be motivated. The Doji Kiri Yasusuna rivals the Demon Blade Lavatane in power, it gives us no special skills, but it is slightly more balanced in its stats. 
Again, it is so very tempting to equip it, yet it's also not the best for our item drop rate. I just don't want to give in, there's still a chance for us to get an Aquarius Empire or a U-Class Earth. Those would easily trump what we currently have in our armor and accessory slots. About the Dojikiri Yasusuna, it is another Sword of Legend as you probably guessed. No, I should say that differently. It is a sword that has a legend attached to it, as the Dojikiri Yasusuna does in fact exist. Unless it's been recently moved, it's in the Tokyo National Museum. As for said legend, the Oni Chieftain Shuten Doji is said to have been killed with it. Yeah, I guess we now possess a genuine Oni Slayer. It makes me want to refight Suika. Perhaps that dirty little liar would freak out once we whipped out such a bane of her species. Sakuya might even defeat her proper now and not just win a more or less staged fight. Lots of yucky bugs in here. That and gross kappa. Sorry that I can't let that go. It amuses me. Zun's art style is so often belittled, but it's really nice that he tries to make all characters look pleasant and somewhat cute. He does this by not sticking too close to the lore, which could give them a flawed appearance. If he had designed his characters more in line with their mythologies, Nitori would be bald. There is in fact a fan joke that she partially is under her cap. Also, Aya, Momiji and Hatate would have long Pinocchio-esque noses. And let's not forget about Riggle. She always has a colony of bugs around her, on her and maybe even some going in and out of her mouth while talking. Okay, let's stop with this quasi-bashing. Just for the record, didn't want to upset anyone. Let's wrap things up. The central chamber of B18 is a good place to take a break, once it is night free and overall safe. I'm Geshady6, this was Toho Kokushin, and next time, greed before need. Bis bald!